welcome, welcome everyone. I am delighted to uh, uh, see you all here and welcome you to our first virtual speaking advocate showcase. My name is Celia Hughes and I am the executive director of Arts Park Texas and just thrilled to be here. We've had a wonderful time with our class uh, this, uh, this spring or winter. And, um, and you know, who knew we could take it, uh, take it online, but we took our curriculum that we developed uh, a few years ago, uh, made it, uh, made it work in the virtual world. We're very, very happy with uh, what's happening with this and uh, hoping to take some of these uh, speakers and some other folks and launch a podcast so soon to be coming uh the speaking advocates changing the world one story at a time so very excited about that it's been wonderful to work with uh miss boy i'll let her introduce herself she's been with us now for a little over a year well actually a little bit longer than that but she took over this uh program when Eric uh, stepped back a little bit, uh, but Eric's on the call. So thank you, Eric, for all the work that you did, the heavy lifting to get this program uh, where it is today. So uh, with that, I'm going to say welcome to Miss Boy Nano Nagel. Hello. Hi, my name is Miss Boy. Um, I have been thrilled to teach this class. I was excited about it when I first heard about it in its original form. And then to be able to do it virtually with such a wonderful group of students who have worked so hard and been so patient with us transferring a, a seven, seven three hour class schedule live to um, six um, hour and a half classes. So. There were things we thought we'd be able to do that we couldn't do. They had to do a lot of writing at home and they did. And a um, lot more than they didn't get the chance to do that in class, um, but they've all worked really, really hard. And um, I'm so proud of them all. Um, I um, want to tell you that I, I'm also a member of Tilt Performance Group and with, there's a number of people in this class, I have to say, who could quite easily be a member of Tilt Performance Group because of their skills and how they developed over the past seven weeks. In fact, there's a, actually at least one member of TILT in the, one of our speakers. Um, and um, I want to thank Celia for her patience of helping me through this process and editing everybody's work um, and helping each person get their piece to reflect them in the best way possible. Everything that is written is in their own words and um, in their own voice. So, um, the, we're going to start our proceedings today. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted to say is that the joy of this class is that we had some people who had previously been trained as speaking advocates with us. And then we had a whole load of new people and everybody worked together and supported each other. Um, it's been a really great experience of camaraderie and friendship and support with uh, the diverse abilities and skills in this group and personalities. Um, it's been awesome. It's going to be so sad and such a relief. No, it's going to be so sad that we're done. Mm -hmm. So um, can you please uh, give us a little um, ASL wave for Gen Jennifer, our first speaker. Hi, my name's Jennifer McKinney and I'm reading Halloween 1993. A black cat, a 1950s girl, a gorilla, a hippie, and a fox walk into Amazio's pizza. This sounds like the beginning of a joke, but we did exactly that on the night of Halloween 1993. I, of course, was the gorilla. I have always loved Halloween, but the anxiety of having to bring Valerie, the neighborhood bully, along with us really ruined it that year. She had invited herself to join us once again, and I found myself 
outnumbered by my friends who liked her. As usual, I felt frustrated and unable to stand up for myself. It was a deliciously dark and rainy Halloween night. We set off together. I started to relax and have fun. Suddenly, Valerie and my friends ran ahead, leaving me standing alone in the dimly lit night. I felt the familiar buzz of the rising anxiety in my head flowing through my body as I ran back to my mom's car. I was crying and angry, bubbling over with embarrassment and shame. I was miserable. Halloween with friends was supposed to be fun. What made this even more confusing was that Valerie claimed to be a friend, but she didn't act like one. Even events like this with Valerie happened repeatedly throughout my childhood and into my middle school years. Finally, much to my relief, she moved away. It wasn't until later that I realized she hadn't moved far enough. In my early 20s, I took some classes at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. I had my first apartment near campus. I also had a few great classes with understanding and helpful professors. I was learning how to be a self-advocate. I had my family nearby and a growing circle of friends. Finally, my anxiety was under control. So life was pretty good. Then it happened. I was grabbing a bite to eat after class in the student union when I saw her again at the next table. Yes, Valerie had reappeared in my life. Inside, I was screaming, you don't belong here, and go back to the swamp you crawled out of. In that moment, I could choose to ignore her and walk away or face my childhood demon. But I thought maybe we had both grown up some, so... Maybe we really could be friends. On the outside, I was my usual friendly self and I chose to face her. I said, hi, Valerie and Valerie's friend to the two girls at the table. Valerie flipped her long brown hair and looked at me like I was a squashed bug. Her friend started laughing and said to her something to the extent of, well, that was rude. In the silence that followed, they looked at each other and both started laughing again. I was mortified. I left the dining area mumbling under my breath. Bye, Valerie. That was your last chance. I am happy to tell you that I have never had to deal with the likes of her again. Over the years, I began to forget about Valerie and her mean girl games. Of course, I met other people like her, and I'd like to tell you I no longer allow myself to be bullied, but the truth is I still don't always recognize them as quickly as I would like to. It takes practice, and I'm a work in progress. I can tell you that I am not that little girl anymore. I am a mature adult and I know now 
that Valerie's actions speak more about who she is than it does about me and who I am. My experience with her taught me a valuable lesson. Even when I feel the most powerless, I still have choices. I am the only person responsible for those choices. Today, I choose who I call my friends. I do not need to convince people to like me. I feel better now that I've said that out loud. I want to keep learning and growing as an individual and as a friend. I know more about friendship now than I did when I was younger. I offer friendship to people who accept me as I am, people who are kind and understanding. I am learning to build friendship on mutual respect and appreciation. Thank you. Yay! The crowd went wild. Yay. Thank you, thank Jennifer. You, thank you for, for setting us off on a great start. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Oh, yay. <laughs> and our next speaking advocate is my fellow Tilt Performance Group member, Kristen. Woo! The title of my story is I Was Meant to Shine. Performing is my passion. I'm an actress with cerebral palsy, and I use a wheelchair for mobility. Sure, my wheelchair has made it hard for me to just blend in. As a teenager, I used to resent this, but then I realized that blending in is so overrated. I was meant to shine. Nearly seven years ago, I joined Tilt Performance Group a theater company for actors with disabilities. That's how I rediscovered my passion for performing. I love the rush. I can't explain it. There's just something magical about being on stage and connecting, not only with my castmates, but with the audience too. I can take words on a script and bring the characters to life. Give them a voice, make the audience adore them or love to hate them. Not many people can say that. As much as I am a proud member of Tilt and as much as I love being an actor, it's hard work. There's taking classes, memorizing lines and blocking, going to a lot of rehearsals and don't get me started on the torturous tech week. Then there's the relationships with my fellow actors, which are not always easy. Easy. And if I want to keep working, I must go through the audition process. This can be daunting. Cold reading is challenging for those of us with dyslexia. I've learned to ask for a copy of the speech. I can spend days practicing for a five minute speech. Feel really good about it. And the director might still say, sorry, we've decided to go in a different direction, which means you didn't get the role. It is disappointing, but I just keep going. Being an actor requires resilience. I find that only one out of the 12 auditions I go on, I get the role. Despite all of this, I've decided to broaden my horizons by performing with other theater companies, film, television. Acting is very competitive. There are far more talented actors than roles. 
It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to find opportunities to perform. Occasionally, I can't help but wonder if ableism plays a part in the fact that I didn't get cast. Other times, I don't have to wonder. I auditioned for a local theater company. I felt proud of my work, of my audition. But before I left, the director said to me, I don't know what to do with a wheelchair on stage. I assured him that I don't need special treatment, that I can pull my own weight, hoping that he might reconsider, but he didn't. My heart dropped into my stomach like a freight elevator. Moments like these sometimes make me want to give up, but I can't quit. Quitting is not in my DNA. How can I complain about lack of representation when it comes to actors with disabilities if I don't keep putting myself out there? And besides, I want to be a role model for other women and girls with disabilities so I can't just give up. I'm happy to say things are changing in the theater. For instance, I recently, recently, a director of a mainstream production who was looking for an actress who actually had, well, she actually used a wheelchair. He wanted that. And a character with cerebral palsy. I almost turned it down because the role was a little young for me, but this was my chance to let people know that actresses who use wheelchairs do exist. When I'm on stage or in front of the camera, this is my chance to open minds. I'm gonna do everything in my power to help people see that when it comes to acting, talent is talent. Disability is irrelevant. Thank you. Yay! Yeah, what she said. Yes, come on, right on. Yes, thank you. And um, I uh, next want to thank. Uh, I want to uh, ask you to please give a warm welcome to one of our, also who is a, um, a previous graduate of Speaking Advocates. Come on. Yay. That is Yay. not come on. No. Oh. Okay. Okay. I myself, I am me, I'm come on. I feel uh, proud of myself for for who I am, my wish allows me to travel. I love to see my family in Seattle in a big group, aunts, uncle, cousins, and grandparents. I love my family. My grandparents are sweet like a big box of chocolate. Sometimes when I visit them, I get a sugar rush. My big wish is to graduate from non -Purell. I want to be a cartoon animator and work for Disney company. I want to speak in front of a million people about how to communicate my needs. I want to be a college professor at UT, teaching signs and become a guest speaker. I would like to travel around the world first class. I will offer free education to the people around the world about common ground so there will be no more prejudice. I have two pictures taken of me in 2015. In the first, I am holding a sign that says, my dream is one day to be. In the second picture, my sign says, to be me and show the world who I am. 
every time I look at these pictures, it gives me a great joy and a sense of pride. All my life, I've been a pleaser. I always try to make other people feel happy. I've been a public speaker to raise money for many organizations. I'm proud to tell my story. I've been volunteering at Dill Children's Hospital since the age of 13 up until 12th grade. After that, I've been volunteering off and on for different organizations such as hospice, Special Olympics, and Nonpareil. When I help others, it gives a great joy to my heart. All my life, I always felt loving people, no matter their age, gender, religion, or race. Having a gift of loving everyone brought so much joy to my life. And I am inviting you all to unify with me to educate others to love each other. The more we love, the less we'll see each other's differences. Together, we can overcome prejudice. Thank you for listening. Yay! Thank you, Kamala. Oh, awesome. oh, Yay. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, the first of our new Speaking Advocate members. Please welcome Jennifer H. Hello, my name is Jennifer Howell, and my story is From Helper to Self-Advocate. As the daughter of parents with disabilities, I have always had a heightened sense of awareness of the struggles and needs of those who are disabled. I adored and respected my mom and dad and considered myself to be extremely sensitive and empathetic of their daily experiences with pain and discrimination. And I was. In dad's case, you couldn't tell at first glance that he was a polio survivor. Yet after a while, an observer could easily see that one leg and foot were shorter than the other. I know this affected the way he was treated at times. On the one hand, there were bullies who made fun of him. On the other hand, some people reacted with compassion. There were also the times he wasn't hired for a job or was pity because his body wasn't normal. My mother's experience was different. She had slurred speech and balance problems. This was certainly visible to others, but it was often misinterpreted. It was not clear just by looking that she had a brain tumor. So to other people, she did not automatically fit the label of disabled. More than once, someone asked if my teetotaler mom had a drinking problem. My heart was filled with sadness and pain at their assumptions and judgments, if they only knew. Even though the two who brought me into this world spent months of their life as hospital patients and depended on crutches and wheelchairs to aid their mobility. Even though I had spent a lifetime at their side witnessing their circumstances. It was not until I began inhabiting my own disability that I could start to truly imagine the world from their perspective. I realize my experience of disability is more like my mom in that there is something visible, yet easily misinterpreted. I walk slowly and limp. The limp tends to get worse the longer I am standing or walking. And damn it, I don't want to tell everyone or anyone I meet. Hello, I'm Jennifer. I have arthritis, deformed bones, bone on bone in some joints, and I am in 
so much pain that I can barely concentrate on this conversation that I am trying to have with you right now. They have no idea that I have a medical diagnosis. Then I think, why should I have to explain myself? Make excuses for who I am and how I move through the world. As you can tell, this is something I am still coming to terms with as I grow into my new identity as a woman with a disability. These days, I notice details about the world around me that did not catch my attention before. For example, I love the Ellen Show. But to the best of my recollection, of all the audience members chosen to play a game on stage, not one has been in a wheelchair or had another visible disability, not even once. And on a weekly basis, Ellen and her sponsors make lavish donations to single moms with financial difficulties, persons who have survived natural disasters or individuals battling illness or some other adversity. Oftentimes, these recipients of her generosity might wheel themselves across stage, the stage or um, have some type of disability. I'd ask myself, I, I mean, I'd ask myself and my friends and my family, why is it then that an entire segment of the population is left out of the fun games on the show. It's incredible to me that someone as groundbreaking and liberal as Ellen can simultaneously reinforce such a Victorian view of disability. More and more these days, I attend events in which I choose to sit and wait in the food court or on a bench near the doorway or in one of those recliners at the mall that massages your back if you insert coins. I don't want my friends or family members to endure my slow limp, especially if they're in a hurry. As I sit there, feeling a bit left out, I wonder if this new normal is what my parents and my friends with disabilities have been feeling all along. Even though every day I navigate a world not designed with me in mind, I'm not likely to ask for accommodations. I mean, accommodations are for those people with real disabilities, not for me. I'm not that bad. My disability isn't as bad as theirs, I'll be fine. I'm not sure if these thoughts of mine are internalized ableism, my resistance to making an awkward fuss, or my use of denial as a coping strategy. But I do know that awareness is the first step towards change. It's a step I am willing to take, even though I know it might come with pain. It's a step toward learning to be as good an advocate for myself as I've been for my family and friends all my life. Yeah, I'm worthy of that. Yay! Yes! Bravo! <laughs> Yay! Good job! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful! So now we're going to go back to one of our um, uh, previously, what are they, not previously graduated, what I'm going to say, one of our experienced speaking advocates, that's the word boy. Um, can you please welcome, welcome Alicia. <coughs> Yay. Yay, Alicia. Okay. Okay, are you, okay, are you, uh, are you uh, ready? We are ready, we are ready. And okay. <clears throat> Off you go, Alicia, go. Always waiting. Every January, I am remembering as the year, the, 
the new year comes, start to register for camp. I meet my doctor for medical forms and medications. I go shopping for nice, comfortable clothes, jeans for horse riding, shorts for the giant swing. I love being at camp, even though 2019 was difficult. There was back bacteria in the food and I got sick. Going to camp is very important to, for me, very important. The COVID 2020 season didn't let things do its work. Things at home didn't, didn't work for, for, for me. Three, I mean, beginning <clears throat> in March, we had to wear masks Everything was canceled. Spring camp was canceled. I could not believe it. During lockdown from outside, I had to do virtual camp on Zoom and it didn't work out for me. Throughout these months, I had to be patient, close to unbearable. Be patient, waiting on good news is the worst. I kept thinking about good news coming to help with COVID. I kept trying to be grateful for all, I mean, for the good things, good things like virtual camp with bingo, chat, dance parties, and even cook, I mean, even cooking to help at home. But COVID is awful, so not very grateful. <clears throat> the new year, 2021, I was ready to leave COVID 2020 behind. All I wanted was the good news. The camp is going to do registration and open through, I mean, there, came my mom dropping the bomb about camp 2020. I said, I will not wait, not hear about waiting so long again. There was no light at the at the end of the tunnel. It made me upset, fussy. It made me uncomfortable. 
I said, I don't care. Forget about it. I don't I mean, like happenings with in within my control to pass by me. I can, I mean, I could not could believe things would would change, but thing, but then self realizing my emotion would scream or fright or flight. I was afraid. I would I felt like puff the magic dragon. When he lost all his friends, I remember having sudden outburst of crying throughout the day in morning especially. My dad is persistent about supporting, uh, I mean, supporting camp to open up. He says, we must wait, be patient. I prayed for camp to be open. Dad was patient. He was right, but it was hard at night in my room. Cricket rubbing sound reminds me of air, I mean, of camping. Airplane sound reminds about flying to camp. There were stars above flying airplane skies when I am flying airplane. I know there is more above. Smell of cold winter grass reminds me of the camp fire roast some s'mores i can smell fresh air it is cool cool cold clean with gentle breeze it touches my face, giving calmness, relaxing with sense for a moment, feel hope, grateful, grateful is patient. Yay, Grateful is yay, patient. Yay, Alicia. Okay. Finally, uh, but last but not least in this half um, is Laura. And I'd ask you when Laura's done, if um, as many as you as possible could um, turn on your cameras before the intermission. Um, if you're willing, so we can take a screenshot of your beautiful faces and keep it for posterity. So, but first of all, please welcome one of our new graduates, Laura. Yay, Yay Laura. Yay. The, the title of my story is called Finally Waking Up. I've always been shy and reserved. There aren't too many moments where I've ever made a present. I've always tried to blend in with the wallpaper. 
I'm rarely loud, rarely comfortable in any environment or with any crowd. I'm uncomfortable in my own skin. Slowly, I've been trying to break myself of this shyness and take ownership of my life. In order to make any progress, however, I, had re I realized that I had to let go of my deep-seated belief that I can't make decisions for myself. I had an awakening, if you will. Get it? Because I have narcolepsy. And I realized that I'm an adult and I don't have to ask permission to try a new hobby or go to a new doctor. I could just do it. I also realized that for so long, I had thought so poorly of life because I was exhausted all the time. And I tended to focus on the negative. I was tired of looking at life bleakly. So I began to actively seek reasons to live and enjoy what time I have on earth. I found a doctor who was willing to listen to me and who began to treat me for narcolepsy. Finally, some relief from my sleepiness. Now I had enough energy to try new things. I started taking guitar lessons, something I've wanted to do my whole life, and traveling to meet with friends and family pre-COVID. My favorite new adventure was an acting class. This was extremely out of character for me. I had met the instructor, Garrett, at a comic convention, and he told me he was offering an acting class. Just the thought of attending was terrifying, which is exactly why I wanted to go. The class was small, only about six or seven students, and it wasn't theater, it was in front of a camera. I had never felt more comfortable and freer to be myself than in that class. Everyone was warm and welcoming, no one intimidated me, and I felt like I could really be myself. It was also the most confident I had ever felt. I really believed I could do what these students were doing and face the criticism I would get without feeling humiliated. For someone who is uncomfortable in her own skin and always has a wall between herself and others, this is a huge empowering moment. I felt vulnerable, but instead of letting it inhibit me like I have in the past, I allowed myself to be at peace with that vulnerability. It was a liberating experience. Unfortunately, COVID hit before I had a chance to attend another class, but I have something to look forward to when it's safe to go back. Yay! Yay. Oh, wow. What a great way to end our first half. We have um, uh, we have seven more advocates for you. Uh, so please don't leave before the time if you can stick it out with us. Um, everybody has worked so hard. Um, and um, can you please welcome Jordan? Hey. 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 Go Jordan. <laughs> Got this. Okay. Oops. Jordan, um, you're running around. I don't have you on oh, pins right. yet. No, you stay still. Um, no, yeah, you'll okay. be grounded. <laughs> but I'm trying to help Celia out here. Again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, you go. There she is. She's looking. There we go. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Let me do that. I'll give you another intro. Please welcome Jordan. Yay. <laughs> Yay. 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 Hi, my name is Jordan Morta, and this is my story about my seizure journey. In October of 2019, I was diagnosed with psychogenic non-elliptic seizures, also formerly known as PNES, Pines, if you will. What I remember most about that year was that was the year I was diagnosed. I remember back then, I was able to go places on my own. I was able to go to the mall with friends without having to worry if I was gonna have a seizure from all the big crowds. Or if I had a phone to call my mom if I needed help. I didn't need any attendants to help me go places freely. I could do the things I enjoyed. But what do I really miss? 
Epsom salt baths, swimming, roller coasters. I mean, I can't even have Starbucks coffee because the caffeine content. I mean, who drinks decaf coffee? Am I right? Just kidding. But this is my new norm. And not having that independence and having different attendants with me can be quite challenging, especially when sometimes you just need time to yourself, time to recuperate a little personal space. But I tell myself every day, I can do this. I can get through this. I got this. You got this. <laughs> but this focus can also cause another seizure. Slowly, I'm learning different techniques to manage my stress. 2021 began better because I started focusing more on my breathing techniques and my breathing exercises. I do meditation and take vitamins, one of my doctors recommended. I changed my diet to plant-based because we found out that really helps with seizures. <sighs> Not having hamburgers and switching to veggie patties can be quite a challenge, let me tell you, especially when you're used to eating meat. But I'm glad because every day I pass by these group of adorable little goats that I know are being eaten because of these trendy tacos called Bidia tacos. <laughs> but seriously, I know I have had less seizures due to my changed diet. Meditation also helps thanks to my small circle of support that I have in place today. I have a great doctor that specializes in PNES seizures. I have a mother who is also a vegetarian too. I have friends that I can depend on when I get stressed. I know now that I'm not alone and that it gets better. Yes, I've learned that life isn't always fair, but life is too short and I'm going to live it to the fullest. Thank yes. you. Yes, well done. <laughs> yes. Bravo. Yay! Good job. Please uh, welcome now um, another one of our new graduates, our fresh new graduates. Please welcome Joey. Yay! Very fresh. So hi everyone, I'm Joey Gitzeg and my pronouns are they and them. And this is a peek into my world. All day and night, I would hear them above me, below me, behind me, to the right of me, the office, the kitchen, the living room, gnawing their way in, burrowing, nesting, scrambling, scratching, scrapping, and I can't talk, but scratching and scraping, there's so many, so many things. The exterminators thought my fear was funny and would say, oh, they are just one inch behind you, barely separated behind that wall. My contamination fears ran wild, intrusive thoughts of them all over me. My face, my food, my neck, my arms, everywhere. So this silence is golden. Maybe this is almost over. There was a period of my life where I was constantly developing new phobias. My contamination fears were so bad that I convinced myself I wouldn't be able to eat food anymore because food grew in the ground with fertilizer and fertilizer has feces in it. And I didn't want to eat feces or think about it when I'm eating. And thinking about it now is disturbing. When I got to that point, there was no other option. I had to eat, whether or not my brain told me I was chewing shit, and that lasted a while. I'm not sure when my brain stopped thinking about it with every meal, but somehow it did. I couldn't play pretend games or fuck with reality. No cops and robbers, too real. I always thought people were going to try to kill me. No giant rats and pandas trying to grab me and pick me up in their claws and paws. I kicked 
and I ran away while the other kids ate pizza and played games. My life was in danger. Understanding intellectually that something isn't real or hasn't happened doesn't do anything to stop the thoughts from intruding and taking over my life. They say that thoughts lead to action, mind over matter. But what happens when they don't? The rats were real. And so was the impact on my mental health. In fact, the winter storm is the only reason that I was finally able to use my kitchen again. You may not see our disabilities, but that doesn't mean they aren't real. We can't pray them away. We wouldn't want to either. The impact is very real and all consuming. Our disabilities shape our perspective and our experience in the world. We can't try any harder than we already are. Tonight, the white noise from the outdated air filter as it blows unfiltered air in need of a change. My soft snoring puppies asleep at my side. Tree twigs tapping on the glass window pane. The sounds of the cars driving by. Normal silence. I forgot what this is like. This might be a good sign but the problem we've dealt with since November is going away. Thank you. Yay! Yay, Joy. Oh, yes, and yay that it's going away. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so now we have uh, another previous graduate, one of our alums. Please welcome Sheena. Sheena. Who is, um, hang on, you're yeah. not centered yet. So I'm, I'm asking people to wait until Celia does it because that helps. Um, yes. I would like to say that Sheena is now a part-time employee at Artspark Texas from um, all the work she does. And she's uh, working with us on as a social media influencer in training. Yay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sheena Walter and this is Advocacy, Courage and Self-Compassion. Don't say anything, just let it go. Not anymore. Growing up, I learned to be a don't rock the boat type person, trying to please everyone, making as few waves as possible. Growing up, I was expected to pass as much as possible, to be as much like my peers as I could, despite my disabilities. Over the years, I have come to understand that I don't have to hide how my brain is wired or how I walk. It's not shameful to use a wheelchair as needed. I've had to learn to find my voice and claim my place as a disabled adult in the world. I'm capable and valuable as I am, and so are my friends who have disabilities. I learned that it is important to challenge injustice and speak up for my rights. Although I am still an introvert and hesitant to confront people, I've learned how to do that in a kind but firm manner. I write letters that show I'm willing to work with a business, you know, to meet them where they are, but not willing to accept discrimination. I am resourceful, articulate, and talented. I use these skills to become an advocate for myself and for others. It is okay for me to be proud of who I am and my work in the world. I have been honored to embody the belief that disability is not something to be ashamed of. It is not something that needs to be hidden. However, the stability of this belief was threatened when I got my peg tube in December, 2020. I have a diagnosis, which is caused by one of my underlying medical conditions called gastroparesis. My stomach doesn't work well. I found myself purposely picking baggy and loose clothing in order to hide the tube. It seems getting the tube has challenged me to face a new level of internalized ableism. I use a wheelchair part-time, but this didn't hit me as hard as it did when I got my tube. I felt shame because I thought people wouldn't accept me with it. It's been a real struggle. I heard somewhere, you are only as sick as your secrets. The internalized ableism has reared its ugly head. 
it feeds on secrecy and I'm having to fight it hard. Committed to being healthy, I made a decision to come out about both my peg tube and my internalized ableism. I decided to be brave. I wrote about my experience, then took a selfie and posted both on social media. In the photo, I'm wearing a shirt where you can see the outline of my tube and my swollen belly from gastroparesis. This really isn't something I should feel I need to hide to be accepted. It's part of my life. I shouldn't be accepted by myself or others to hide my disabilities in order for society to see me as an equal person. I am still integrating the kind, supportive responses to my post. I continue to work through the ableism I've taken into myself as a result of past experiences and socially constructed ideas of normalcy and worth. In order to truly be not just accepting of my disability, but embracing it, I have to fight these beliefs and feelings. They aren't fact and aren't reality. I'm not less of a person because I am disabled. I am committed to living up to my belief that disability isn't something that needs to be secluded and locked away. As a society, we need to not merely tolerate disability, but accept and embrace it. People with disabilities are loved by God. We are no less because of how visible or invisible our disabilities may be. We are no less beautiful, no less desirable or capable of being friends or significant others, no less acceptable to be in public, no less period. Advocacy is often about talking out and taking action in the world, but being an advocate starts within me. If I want to society to change their mindset about me as a person with a disability, I must first change mine about myself. Yay! 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 Yeah. All right. That was yes. amazing, Yay. Regina. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Amazing. Mm hmm. Well, this week is a big week for our next speaker. Um, yesterday, they attended their delayed graduation from Texas A&M for graduating with a master's in business administration, if I've got that right. And say it again. Public administration. Public administration. And now they're graduating from us. I mean, I think ours is probably more significant. I'm just saying, <laughs> but, you know, I've kind of got a what point of view. So please welcome Ka uh, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, you're on, go. Being a disability advocate can be hard, but educating people and building relationships have helped me persevere in the struggle. Not only am I trying to make a difference in the lives of people with disabilities, but I'm also trying to change other perceptions of them and introduce them to ideas about disability that differ from their long held biases, prejudices, and experiences. I've been in many situations where places close their doors or where people close their minds to people with disabilities. One experience in my life was when I was talking to a diversity office about doing a training on disability. I was unable to convince them to do the training and why it was important for disability to be a part of diversity. I left the meeting feeling discounted, unwelcome, and that I was not worth the effort. I just had a sense that they were not open to the idea that inclusion for us is much more than just compliance with the ADA. That disability is, a, is as much part of diversity and intersectionality as race, class, gender, and culture. When someone makes assumptions about us, disability communities, and does not listen when we offer to tell them what is important to us, what we need, and the right way to do things, they contribute to the problem of closing the doors to people with disabilities. 
I believe that educating other people what it is like to live with a disability is key to opening minds. Throughout my college experience, that was my whole goal when advocating for people with disabilities. I worked on building relationships with leaders on campus, constantly putting myself in position to continually advocate for myself and my community with relentless persistence. I had hoped to form a committee to advocate for all students with disabilities. The first few attempts were unsuccessful due to not having people who are committed or not having the right people at the table who could actually make a difference. It was a lot of work. And when one attempt failed, I tried to do it a different way and then another until finally I was successful. It took many years. And what I learned was it was all about forming relationships with people. I couldn't do it alone and needed to bring other people to the table who could truly make an impact. Only then was I able to make a difference. When I started building relationships with other people, I realized that it wasn't that people were ignorant or unsympathetic toward people with disabilities, but that they are simply unaware and that they truly wanted to learn. I've been blessed to have such great friends throughout my college life. These have grown into genuine relationships and I can be myself when I'm around them. I can just be one of the guys. My junior year of college, my five best friends surprised me by taking me on a road trip for a week. We went to Texas, Colorado, and New Mexico, stopping at various destinations along the way. And the first road trip that I've taken with just my friends and not my parents. It truly made me feel like I was one of the guys and not that friend in a wheelchair. On the trip, we joked around, we made fun of each other, and we just had a good time. Not once did I feel like I had to prove myself and they just accepted me for who I was. It was truly one of the most inclusive experiences of my life. Most of the time, I must navigate a world not designed for me. And so when someone opened the doors to me and my friends with disabilities, it shows me that they truly care. It shows me that they wanna know me for who I am as a person and that they value me as an equal. It gives me hope that there will be a world that considers and includes us in the blueprints of any design and not as an afterthought or an add on. Mm -hmm. Until then, I'll continue to educate and create change one relationship at a time. Thank you. Yay! Yeah! 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 yeah. If I could vote, I'd yeah. vote for you. Just saying. <laughs> okay, so next is another one of our recent graduates. This is the amazing Amory. Re, unmute yourself. You are on. Is it your turn, Re? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's Re's turn. I feel sad because my I miss my sister Gracie very much when she's at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. I feel mad because I lost my Amazon Prime video privileges. I feel anxious because I haven't met new friends for a while. I feel smart because I do money math that makes my brain bigger and smarter and bigger. I feel bored because I stay on my laptop for an hour or two instead of helping mom or dad or Miss Lippy get some work done. I feel lonely because I don't have anyone to sit with me to watch a movie or play an arcade machine game or make s'mores outside. Then I remember listening to the sounds last night in bed. The wind rattling reminded me of my hair blowing behind me. The blowing wind makes me feel a lot better whenever I feel stressed. The night sounds reminded me of the stars twinkling in the sky, making constellations. Wind chimes reminded me that I can hear them making music while the wind blows by in my backyard. Water rushing reminded me that I could see a lake or a pond flowing water 
and that makes me feel calm. I feel excited today to be in Speaking Advocates. I want to write about my service and rescue dog, Lily. Lily likes to take squirrels in my front yard and run around my new neighborhood and roll around in the grass. When I went out walking with Lily, I am reminded of how grateful I was that my grandmother, Babishka, is recovering from her hip surgery. I hope she can join me on a walk soon. I feel happy because I know these things are true. I am always here to give you comfort when you're feeling upset or lonely. I am always here to give you good and wise advice when you feel stressed or angry. I am always here to give you confidence when you're feeling stressed or worried. I feel proud of myself when I accomplish something difficult independently without assistance or feedback. I have worked hard to learn how to accept feedback, but I'm most proud of myself when I can solve the problem on my own. I am always here to give you the space you need to build your independence just like I, just like I did. It is, goal, it is a goal worth achieving and you'll be as proud as I was when you get there. I am always here to give you love when you feel sad and blue. I am always here to give you strength when you're when you feel weak. I value loyal friend, friendship, loyalty, bravery, kindness, and family. I am smart, funny, energetic, kind, outgoing, serious, tough, adventurous, beautiful, loyal, brave, and true. I offer my kindness to everyone in my class. Yay! 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 Woo! First time ever good speaking. Yay! Okay. Our um, next speaker is also a fellow TILT member and um, a graduate, previous graduate of the class, an alum. Please welcome Kay. Okay, let's get your on screen. Good. Hi. Hey. Um, my name is Kay, and uh, this is my story. Um, what if, after years of being part of a beloved community, developing close personal friendships, and enjoying programming that nourished you by leading to a better understanding of yourself and engaging in meaningful opportunities for service? You woke up one morning and you no longer had access to all or part of that community. The congregation I belonged to had moved to a new building. At previous events, since churches are exempt from the Americans with Disabilities Act, I would call the church secretary and let her know that I would be bringing my own lights. Fluorescent lighting causes me to have confusion, anxiety, nausea, and even trigger seizures. I arrived late to the class and I decided I would wear my blindfold until there was a break to allow me to set up my lights. I a collection of clamp lamps that I keep in my trunk for just such occasions. The next day, I received a call from the minister telling me how rude I was to expect them to change the lighting. I was told that I was disruptive to the class and had unrealistic expectations. Furthermore, I had prevented the leader from having the accommodations he needed and that I should just wear my blindfold at church in the future. I should mention the class was taught by a man who had both a mobility impairment and a visual disability. His brother and sister were helping him. And it was the brother that insisted that we go ahead and set up my lighting. I was very appreciative. I was devastated by what felt like rejection by my congregation and experienced a wrenching sense of loss. When I attempted to return, I ended up just walking out in tears. I was no longer able to listen to the minister's message of inclusion. Access to spiritual or religious communities has been shown to be a part, an important part of well-being for those who participate. 
Many people develop skills in leadership, hospitality, and other forms of service within their faith communities. This can lead to helpful connections to community opportunities, such as employment and education. Service opportunities are an important part of developing self-worth and demonstrating competency. Theology that sees the disabled as a one-way service opportunity misses out on a larger reward. If your congregation is important to you, you want to make sure it is there for you. If loving others through service is important to you, you want to make sure others can take advantage of the spiritual nourishment that your community provides. If assisting others in their personal spiritual transformation is important to you, then you want your community to ensure these opportunities are accessible physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to all. It is not required by law. It is required by love. The most challenging place I have had, had found to advocate for myself and other people with disabilities has been my church. Yay. Yay. Okay. Yay. Well done. All right. Um, here we are. We're at the last one. Oh my gosh. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, uh, this is another one of our recent graduates from this season um, and um, has a really, I have to say, and this is a compliment, British sense of humor. I just got to say. <laughs> and that because it's like, yeah, anyway. So if you need an explanation, you can email me and I'll tell you all what that means. So please welcome, but you will see his sense of humor in his piece. Please welcome mm -hmm. John. Yeah, you're pinned, you're good. Yeah. Thank you. My name is John Moeller, and this is Is There a Doctor in the House? Now, we're here to open minds and share experiences. It's in the title of our class Share Experiences and Open Minds. I want you to see through my eyes, but I'll need your help first. If you look behind my ear, there's a little latch and uh, I can't reach it. So could you get that for me? It just pops right up and the top flips off. There, and now you can just have a seat. There's a captain's chair right behind my eyes. You want to have a seat? Yeah, and then I'll flip it back closed. There, all right. Now you'll see there's emergency exits to your left and to the right. And strap yourself in because it could be a bumpy ride. Now, we've been quarantining religiously, but today is a special mission because we're out of staples here at the house. But even more importantly, my wife, Marianne, is out of Dr. Pepper and caregivers and lovers cannot exist by bread alone. So it's Diet GP staff. I mean, you haven't seen Marianne without Diet Pepper. Dr. Pepper, ah, we gotta hurry, let's get out of here. Okay, so we pushed through to the front door and already she's got the wheelchair lift lowered. So let's back onto the wheelchair lift. And then we go up into the van. So we have to back into the back of the van and make sure there's room on all four sides for the tie downs. And while she's doing that, we kick on the jams and we go on our way. Now, rules of the road. These country roads can be bumpy, so you have to hold tight. So I want all of you to do something with me right now. All right, now tighten up your stomach muscles, right? And pull in your belly button to your spine and push your, push your elbows into the armrests. Can you feel how tight your belly is right now? Good, because brace yourself. Here come the railroad tracks. <laughs> oh, it, it's rough riding with me, but just hang in there. I, I promise I'll try to uh, warn you when the other potholes come, all right? All right, let's head on to the country highway. So we drive past the old wood mill. There's homesteads. There's a few ranches. And there's an old family cemetery we go by. 4.5 miles to New Waverly, Texas. Population 1142. There's not a lot of money for roads. And everybody drives big trucks, trucks, 
So brace yourself, pot hole. <laughs> I, I, I told you it could be a rough ride with me, right? So when we pull into the dollar, park, dollar store parking lot on the right, if you're hanging with me, I will get you a candy bar inside. So let's mask up, let's go in and out of there. All right, now it's time for a game. Now, you remember the classic video uh, game, uh, Pac-Man, right? Everybody knows that game. Well, this will be like Pac-Man in 3D. All right, you and I are going to navigate the maze of aisles looking for our treasures, which today are going to be noodles, fruit, and protein bars. Meanwhile, we have to wander our way around like obstacles and especially the dupas that don't wear masks. Don't get me started on them. That's a whole nother speech. So we gotta be quick because if we don't, we could contract COVID. That would be game over. Meanwhile, Marianne's gonna be working on her own list and then we'll join her afterwards, all right? So you ready to play game one? Are you ready to play player one? Let's do it. Game begin. All right, let's go down the first aisle. Waka, 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 waka. That, that's like a noise I like to make underneath my mask. If you remember the noise from Pac-Man, you should see people's faces when I go by. Waka, 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 waka. I, I have to be careful. I mean, I have fun, but I got to pay attention because if I concentrate on aisle one. But at the end of the first aisle, we've already found our first treasure, which is pod time noodles. Okay, so I can't reach the pod time noodles. I can't run. There's a pallet in the middle of the aisle. We have to skip it. Next, next section. All right, now we're in produce. Apricots look good. Okay, A is for apricot. So we got P, then we got A. And we also got a family having a family reunion in the middle of the aisle on the left side. And on the right, here comes a dupo without a mask. Think fast, back out of here. Waka, 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 waka. We go to the next aisle, go three quarters of the way down and there's a grocery cart right in the way. Turn around and go back out. Waka, 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 waka. Next aisle. Looking, coast is clear, coast is clear. Let's go, 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 go down the aisle. Ah, it's housewares. Nothing good to eat here. Next aisle. Ah, look, it's our final treasure. It is protein bars. Actually, they're called Lara bars. L is for Lara. So we have P, we got A, and we got L, P A L, pal, pal. So let's go find Marianne and we'll track down pal. And then, of course, she secured already the prime directive, which is a grocery cart full of diet DP, which is liquid gold. So let's go pay for this stuff and get out of here. Waka, 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 waka.